Hello, good morning. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> wow. Uh, for, for those of you who don't know me, I'm married to Brian Anderson. He's our senior pastor. My name is Thora. I have a brother, Thane, sister, Thala. And contrary to what some people thought in the small town I grew up in, when my parents yelled, Thane, Thala, Thora, they did not have a lisp, okay? They were just, they were like ahead of their time on the unusual names for kids deal. Question for you. How many of you have ever been really offended by someone else? And I mean really offended to where like, you can't sleep at night and your mind's going over and over what happened. I mean, I have, there's, you know, a hundred or so honest people here. I have way too many times. I'm not proud of that fact. And I want to start off today by telling you three short stories. The first two about myself and the other one about Joseph from the Bible. You know, one time I was offended by a friend who, if you can believe this, did not invite Brian and I to her daughter's wedding. I'm like, what? Now, I'm not proud of the fact that I was offended by that. But so the daughter of a friend of ours was getting married, and the mom told me, the wedding's really small. It's basically just family. So I'm like, okay. Well, then in conversation, I find out two of my close friends were invited, and they weren't family. And then I found out a third friend was invited, and I'm thinking, she's not family. And so my feelings were hurt. I mean, I was kind of offended by this, and I ranted and raved some to Brian about it, and he blew it off a whole lot easier than I did. He was like, we don't have to go to the wedding? Great, you know, <laughs> guys. And I couldn't sleep the night I found out. And then it bothered me, it said it bothered me that much. And what you could actually say is I was offended. I told Brian in one conversation, when our kids get married, they're not getting invited to the wedding. <laughs> Now, time has gone by, and I think I've released the offense, and I've moved forward. I think what hurts worse than a personal slight, though, is when someone is mean to one of your children. And uh, I've also been offended by kids and their parents, especially when your kids are little, and kids are learning how to interact with each other. And you know how people say you'd rather deal with the dad than the mom? I think that's true in our family, because I have a hard time holding my emotions intact if somebody's mean to one of my kids. So this time, one of our kids was getting bullied at school, emotionally and verbally. And Brian and I emailed the mom of the, one of the kids, who we thought our child was friends with, to see if she knew about it and if she would have a conversation about it. Basically, she emailed us back and blew us off and said, kids are kids. And as my daughter says, she said, this is a you problem. Now, this was someone our child had had playdates with. I mean, we had been in each other's homes. And I couldn't believe she was so unconcerned and didn't want to find out what a total jerk her child was being, you know? My kid was getting bullied. And in my heart, I was glaring. But it was a Christian school, you know? So you have to act nice on the outside. <laughs> and she worked there, which made it even worse. I saw her all the time. But I thought of her, and I'm like, no wonder her kid is such a jerk. She's a jerk. <laughs> now, I've, I've processed it since. I have had conversations with her, and I don't think she's a total jerk. Some of you, unfortunately, have gone through way worse betrayal than that. You've gone through abuse. Maybe your spouse committed adultery, and unfortunately, the list goes on and on. Third story I want to mention is in the book of Genesis. It's the story of Joseph. And most of you have read the story of Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his brothers. And when they were growing up, Joseph's father gave him preferential treatment. And it was obvious to all of the brothers. It went on and on. One time he gave him this coat of many colors. And his brothers resented him because their father liked him best. Year after year, these things happened. To top it off, Joseph is a bit of a dreamer, and he shared his dreams with his brothers, and in the dreams, the brothers were always in an inferior position to Joseph, and they didn't like it. They didn't like him. They were offended by him. And I mean, one time, their little brother had this dream where they were bowing down to him. It's like, who does he think he is? And when given the opportunity, they thought about actually leaving him in a pit to die, but instead, some Egyptian slave traders were coming through, and they thought, if we're going to get rid of the kid, why not make some money anyway? 
So they sell him to the slave traders. Now realize, when a person in this time period was a slave, they're a slave until they die. If they get married, their wife and children are slaves also. This is a horrible, horrible thing Joseph's brothers did. Now, if you were Joseph, would you be just a little bit tempted to be offended by your brothers? Like when you realize this is not a sibling joke, they are literally selling you to slave traders. They're not going to get you out of the pit. Parents, take note. Favoritism hurts everybody in the family. It hurts the favored child. It hurts the kids who are not favored. It's never a good thing to do. Later, to top it off, Joseph's serving as a slave, and his master's wife in Egypt tries to seduce him. And he does not go for, go for that. But then she, because she's angry about that, tells her husband that Joseph tried to seduce her. And he gets stuck in prison. Now, while you're in prison, if you were Joseph, would you be maybe planning mental revenge against your brothers while you're slaving away and thinking maybe, you know, I don't even know if I want to serve a God anymore who let this happen to me. Would you be offended? There's a, there's a reason there are a ton of movies that deal with the theme of being wronged and getting revenge. There's human nature in there. Now, Joseph does forgive his brothers, and years later, he rises to power in Egypt, and he's able to save their lives and their families' lives in a time of famine. To top it off, Joseph tells his brothers, God meant it all for good. God's plans will not be thwarted. You could read the whole story later, starting in Genesis 37. Joseph was a real amazing person who chose not to pick up offense against his brothers. Offense is like a computer virus. An offended person gets infected. And like a computer virus, the virus can start to affect all the relationship programs in your life. And if we're not careful, it can take over the way we operate, the way we think, and the way we talk. It begins to affect all of our relationships. You know, we might get a virus from time to time, but we don't have to let it run over and run wild. So let's just pause for a minute and pray and ask God to meet with us today. Father, you're our great physician, and we ask you today that you would help each one of us hear what you want us to hear, to let the things you don't want us to pick up be gone away. But Father God, I ask that you would speak to each one here something they need to hear today. We ask your blessing on today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let me ask you, why is it some people that you know seem to get so hardened emotionally? They get irritated, angry, even Christians get kind of mean-spirited. Why is that? Well, often at the root of unkind and hardened, emotionally hardened behavior is offense. Offense is to a normal person like kryptonite is to Superman. Now, if you're under like 22, okay, before the Marvel Cinematic Universe, <laughs> there was a character called Superman when I was a kid from DC Comics. Anyway, he was the big deal. His arch nemesis, Lex Luthor, or somebody would always be trying to get kryptonite in his path because it drained him of life and vitality and energy and he couldn't do what he was supposed to do. That's what offense does to us. It drains us of life and energy and our Christian witness. It's a major problem, and the enemy tries to use it in every one of our lives. The fact is, offense is a trap any of us can fall into. A couple things about traps. First of all, traps are baited. Look at what the Bible says in Amos 3. Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground when there's no bait in it? No. The reason animals and birds fall into traps is because they have bait in them, and the bait is enticing. You know, years ago, I think of this, it was before we even had our kids. We were visiting my parents in Missouri, and I grew up in an agricultural area. And you know, even if you're in your 30s, your parents are your parents, right? So Brian and I are in our bedroom, and we were in the bed, just getting ready to go to sleep, and this mouse ran across the floor. And so I did what any 30-some-year-old, I got up, got up and ran into my parents' bedroom and said, there's a mouse in the house. And my dad sat up from a deep sleep and he said, we've never had a mouse in this house. I'm like, we've got, you've got a mouse in the house now. So my dad later got traps and set them with, I think it was peanut butter, and he caught the mice. 
because that's what traps do. The trap doesn't spring shut unless something tries to take the bait, and the bait has to be enticing. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus says it is impossible that offense will not come. If we're going to live in the real world, then we're going to have to learn how to deal with offense because it is coming. The people we live with and work with will usually all give us a lot of opportunities. So we have to learn how to not take the bait. The second thing about traps is the most effective and deadly traps are not only baited, but they're also hidden. A great verse to remember is 2 Corinthians 11:14. 14. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. You know, Satan is not going to make things obvious for us, or it wouldn't be a trap. Traps aren't labeled with big signs saying, this is a trap, neon sign, beware, don't step here. That's not the way traps are. The trap of offense is usually hidden, and unlike a mouse trap, people who have stepped into the trap are usually oblivious that they've stepped into the trap of offense. One of Satan's most dangerous and deceptive kinds of bait is something we've all encountered, offense. When you look at it this way, the idea that offense is the bait in the trap. You can see that offense in itself would not be deadly as long as it stayed in the trap. In other words, the opportunity to be offended will present itself to you way more times in your life than you want. But it only gets you if you pick up the bait. Fish can look at bait on a hook, but they only get trapped if they bite the bait. If we pick up a fence, bite the bait, so to speak, and feed on it in our hearts, then it becomes like poison to us, like kryptonite to Superman. It can't hurt us if we don't pick up the bait. But when we do pick up the bait and become offended, and offended people produce fruit. You've probably seen this in your own life and the lives of others as well. Often what happens is we get our feelings hurt. And I'm sure Joseph's brothers had their feelings hurt and they felt justified in how they treated him. Look at what their dad did. Look at the way Joseph seemingly put them down. They'd had their feelings hurt year after year. They're offended by Joseph. But years later, offense produces fruit like anger, outrage, jealousy, resentment, bitterness, envy, hatred. And some of the consequences of picking up that offense are insults, attacks, division, separation, broken relationships, betrayal, and backsliding. Usually the people who are offended do not even realize they are trapped. They're oblivious to their condition because they're so focused on the wrong that was done to them or to someone close to them. The most effective way for the enemy to blind us is to cause us to focus on ourselves. Offenses have the power to handicap and hinder us from growing in Christ and fulfill, fulfilling our true potential, our true calling from God. Another interesting thing about offense is that those closest to us have the ability to hurt us the most. The closer the relationship, the deeper the hurt. And some of you in this room can relate to the feeling that offenses from those closest to us feel like betrayal, man. They feel like a knife in the heart. Let's look at Psalm 55, verse 12. For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide myself from him. But it's you, a man my equal, my companion and my familiar friend. We who had sweet fellowship together and walked in the house of God in the throng. The bloodiest wars are civil wars. Brother against brother, father against son. The meanest, messiest court cases are usually divorce cases. Some of the deepest hurts and offenses come in people's lives from people they sit next to in church people they're related to, people they work with, people they're married to, maybe from an authority figure. Here's the deal. We can become bound by a fence when we pick the bait up out of the trap. You know, I think of one family I know where the husband had an affair and he left his wife. It was completely wrong, unfair, unjust. The wife was hurt and offended. 
But it got to the place where the kids started having a hard time being around her because even a few years later, it was all she could think about and talk about and make comments about the husband. She was so negative. Now, was she wronged? Yes. Did she have a right to be angry? Yes, but you can't live there. If you do, it ends up permeating the people around you. The key to overcoming offense is to not pick up the bait. Don't take the bait. Would you say, don't take the bait with me? Don't take the bait. Let's say it again. Don't take the bait. Okay, think about Joseph again. Wouldn't it have been easy for him to say, it's my brother's fault I'm in this situation. It's their fault, and I am blaming them. And how often we hear things like, it's my parents' fault, I'm this messed up, they were so messed up, they messed me up. You know, it was, it's my wife's fault, nag, 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 it's my husband, he was so controlling, it's my boss, if she had just promoted me, you know, she's an idiot and she hasn't. It's easy to blame people for our situation. I've often seen two kids from kind of a really messed up family, but years later, only one of them is living in a fence. Realize this, God holds our destiny. His plans for Joseph were still fulfilled even though Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. When Joseph's brothers sold him, I don't think God was busy texting like, OMG, oh my me, what am I gonna do about Joseph? I never saw this one coming. I think I better post this to Facebook, you know? <laughs> However, just because God is in control and God holds our destiny doesn't mean it wouldn't have been very easy for Joseph to pick up the bait. And let's be honest, if you were Joseph, if I were Joseph, I'm thinking, how many years of prayer and counseling would I have to have to get over that? I'm sure it was a process for him as well. Let's talk about the bait of offense. I was very impacted by a book I read years ago called The Bait of Offense. It covers this subject better than I'm covering it today by John Bevere. We do have it in our bookstore if you're interested. Let's look at Luke 17, 1. Then he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. We should all try very hard not to be the one who is offending others. We should try to be kind and gentle and thoughtful. Now, interestingly, the Greek word for offense here comes from the word scandalon. We get our word scandal from that word, and it does seem like a scandal to us when we're offended. The word literally means a stumbling block. When people pick up offense, it causes them to stumble and fall. Another interesting thing about this word is that it originally referred to the part of the trap to which the bait was attached. So the word signifies laying a trap in someone's way. In the New Testament, it often describes an entrapment used by the enemy. See, the enemy, Satan, loves to lay traps. And he has a bait shop full of offensive things to try. And he knows the bait for one person will not be the same as the bait for somebody else. An important thing we need to know about offense is, offense is a tool of the devil to bring people into captivity. The question is not, do you think things are going to happen that are going to offend me? No, the question to ask is, since things are going to happen to offend me, what will my response be? We need to decide ahead of time, don't take the bait. Would you say it with me? Don't take the bait. Let's do it again. Don't take the bait. Some of you are going to have an opportunity this week, and I hope what comes to mind is you're going to recognize, oh, yeah, don't take the bait. See, when people are offended, they begin to filter things through past hurts, rejections, experiences. They begin to think those other people are thwarting God's plan in my life. However, the only person who can totally get us out of God's will for us is us. Look at what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. See, Satan wants you captive and ineffective. Because if you're trapped, you're usually unaware you're trapped. When we're trapped, we don't see our true condition. When a person is deceived, he believes he's right, even though he's not. The worst thing about being deceived is you're deceived. You don't realize you're deceived. I, I think of one man we had in our church years ago, and he was a wonderful leader. 
and he let Brian know that the next time we hired a pastor, he would like to be hired. Well, the time came to hire someone, and we didn't feel like that was the Lord, and we hired someone else. Well, it was kind of a matter of time before most of the things we did started, he started getting cantankerous about and cranky and didn't like this and didn't like this, and, and then he left the church. I kind of think he picked up the bait of offense. Not positive, but it seemed like it. I know another guy used to be a wonderful leader in our church. He doesn't even attend church at all anymore because he got into some you know, conflict with someone else at the church that he was friends with, and he left the church offended. Doesn't attend church anymore. Offense is a trap the enemy uses to thwart God's plans for our lives. It doesn't mean the other person wasn't guilty, but when you live in offense, you're not going to be able to do great things for the kingdom of God. Once a person takes the bait of offense, the next thing that happens is an offended person starts to build walls of protection. And these walls are built in order to try to keep from getting hurt again. Mark Twain tells the story of a cat sitting on a hot stove. And he says, after that experience, the cat not only won't sit on a hot stove, it most likely will not sit on a cold one either. That's the way it is with people. So often, we don't want to get hurt again, and so we don't want to go near anything that looks remotely like what happened before. Look at Proverbs 18, 19. A brother offended is harder to be one than a strong city. What happens is we get hurt by someone, and then we build emotional walls. And the walls can become prisons because they not only keep bad people out, they keep good people out. They can even keep God out. They're pretty much non-discriminatory walls. Offenses cause us to miss the grace of God in our lives. And we can become so blinded by the offense that we don't see clearly. Holding on to offense has a way of damming up the ebb and flow of relationships in our lives. And the walls make it harder for us to receive from God and sense his presence, his love, his concern for our lives. Sin traps us. That's a good one to say. Say it with me. Sin traps us. Brian, I used to listen to one pastor who said, sin makes you stupid. I'm not going to make you say that, but in effect, <laughs> it is true, isn't it? Look at Hebrews 12, 15. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Offenses cause us to miss the grace of God in our lives. You can think of grace as the power to be who God wants you to be and to do the things he wants you to do in any situation. I won't be free to walk in God's grace when I'm holding on to offenses. See, I don't have any control over whether weeds grow in my yard or not, but I do have control over whether I let them grow three feet tall. We have to be careful to do weeding in our lives. When we have trials in our lives, when we get offended by someone, it does expose what's in our hearts. And it can either make us better or it can make it bitter. We can choose to walk through the things with God or we can get bitter at God and other people. The fact is we can choose to take the bait or not to take the bait. I mean, just think of some of the offended people you know. When you listen to people's problems, much of the time, it's over an offense. What someone did to them, said to them, didn't say to them, didn't do for them. We need to weed our gardens often. Here's the bottom line. Holding on to an offense hurts us. It, it hurts us. It doesn't hurt them. Even if we were sinned against, holding on to offense is sin. And it has a way of coming back and biting us. Maybe you've heard the story of how an Eskimo kills a wolf. The account is kind of grisly, yet I think it offers great insight into the consuming, self-destructive nature of holding on to offense. I'm dating myself. I got this from Paul Harvey. First, the Eskimo coats his knife blade with animal blood and allows it to freeze. Then he adds another layer of blood and another until the blade is completely concealed in frozen blood. Next, the hunter fixes his knife in the ground with the blade up. When a wolf follows his sensitive nose to the source of the scent and discovers the bait, he licks it, tasting the fresh, frozen blood. 
he begins to lick faster, more and more vigorously, lapping the blade until the keen edge is bare. Feverishly now, harder and harder, the wolf licks the blade in the Arctic night. So great becomes his craving for blood that the wolf does not notice the razor-sharp sting of the naked blade on his own tongue, nor does he recognize the instant at which his insatiable thirst is being satisfied by his own warm blood. His carnivorous appetite just craves more until the dawn finds him dead in the snow. It is a fearful thing that people can be consumed by our own lusts and sins. Will we choose to deal with things like offense, or will we let it consume us? Only God's grace keeps us from the wolf's fate. Don't take the bait. It can be deadly. You know, unfortunately, everyone in this room knows friends or families who don't have a relationship anymore or don't speak to each other because somebody got offended. You know, maybe that's you. We all lose out on relationships and community, which God meant for us to have. Let's look then at the root of offense. The root of offense is real or perceived injustice. That's where offense comes from. You know, when my kids say, that's not fair, I'll say, life is not fair. I mean, life is going to be full of injustice and unfair things. And as far as I can tell, offended people basically fall into three categories. First of all, those who have been treated unjustly. You know, like abuse, there was, like Joseph, there was abuse, there was betrayal. They have been sinned against. Maybe you've had an unfaithful spouse, an, abuse, an abusive partner, an abusive parent, something like that. The second category, it's black and white sin. Those who believe they have been treated unjustly. People like me in the first scenario I told, I mean, people in this category believe in their heart that they've kind of been wronged, but their conclusion is usually drawn from inaccurate information, or the information is accurate, but their conclusion is distorted. Either way, they still, they still hurt. However, they've often judged by assumption, appearance, or hearsay. I mean, anybody in here ever had somebody get mad at you because of misinformation? Okay, it's, it's no fun. Or maybe you've gotten mad at somebody else because of that. It's usually a good idea to ask some clarifying questions on the front end when you think something has happened and don't just assume. Unfortunately, though, most people skip that step and they go straight to being offended. You know, I know one woman once, she assumed I had done something I had not, and a simple question on the front end would have cleared up the matter. But she had gone over the scenario so many times by the time she talked to me that by the time she did talk to me, I could not convince her otherwise. She had gone over it and over it. My father says, you can't talk to an angry man. Meaning if somebody's really angry, they're not hearing what you're saying. You know, they're not really listening to you. And I found that to usually be true. Realize the scriptural thing to do if someone has actually sinned against you, like Matthew 18, is to go to the person and give them the opportunity to respond. And I'm talking black and white sin here, not like you didn't invite me to your party. However, if you are hurt over something, our choice as a Christian is to forgive and to process forgiveness. And if you can't seem to get past it, then maybe you need to go to the person, ask questions, and talk it out with them in a godly, non-accusing way. Don't go to a person until you can be non-accusing. I've noticed over the years, we've been doing this over 30 years, that people who leave one church offended often leave the next church offended too. Offense causes us to draw further away from others and build more walls of protection. Okay, offended people either have been treated unjustly to believe they've been treated unjustly, or the third type of offended person are those who pick up the offense of someone else. In other words, no injustice was done to them, but they listen to what happened or is perceived to have happened to someone else, and now they're offended also. You know, speaking from personal experience, I'm sorry to say, sad to report, that on occasion I have picked up that kind of bait, and it's not that I'm proud of it, but I remember one man, and this is before we even started the church. There was a Christian man, and he was the authority figure in the situation, and he did not treat Brian right. He was very unsupportive in a situation where Brian had done the right thing, but a difficult and an unpopular thing. 
And the details aren't important, but I was angry with this man. I mean, I was offended by him. And you know that lousy feeling you get when you see certain people? Did anybody used to watch Seinfeld? There was this guy that he didn't like named Newman, and whenever he saw Newman, he would say, Hello, Newman. Okay, that's the way I felt when I saw this man. And I would, the thing is, the guy never even did anything to me. I was offended at the way he had treated my husband. I had picked up the bait, man, and I would think over in my mind what a jerk he was, and I wish other people would know what a jerk he was. Now, finally, I was able to release that and hand it over to the Lord. I've talked to the man since. But here's the point. The situation didn't affect him at all. He didn't even know about it. He didn't lose any sleep about it, but I was losing sleep about it and peace, and it wasn't worth it. Anybody relate to that kind of a scenario? It is so easy to take the bait. Another root of offense is unmet expectations, and so easy to have unmet expectations. You know, when we first got married, I thought, you know, at night we'd get into bed, and then we'd have like a conversation and talk about the day, and Brian told me right away, like about the second night, I was trying to have a conversation. She said, Thora, when I go to bed, I want to go to sleep. <laughs> I was like, okay. <clears throat> now, it's easy to take offense if you have unmet expectations. He also would never let me win at backgammon. He was ruthless, okay? Anyway, <laughs> unmet expectations are a subtle form of injustice that can cause people to become offended. Let's look at what James says Chapter 4, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures." People disappoint us to the degree that they fall short of our expectations. Our own desires are not met. You know, for example, I may expect that you're going to buy me a Christmas gift or come and see me when I'm in the hospital or invite me to your daughter's wedding, okay? But when you don't, it's my expectation that gives me the opportunity to be offended. We had one couple in the church years ago and they actually told someone that they left the church because Brian had walked by them a couple of times in the foyer and not spoken to them. Okay, and, and Brian was probably thinking about his message or maybe he was on the way to the bathroom before he spoke. In no way was it a personal slight. Have you ever heard the phrase, it's not about you? But the offended person thinks of whatever they're wanting you to do that you don't do as an injustice and that you let them down and they get offended. And it is so easy to fall into that kind of thinking because no matter what you do, you will let some people down. And on the other hand, are there people that you possibly expect too much from as well? You know, a friend's birthday's forgotten. You don't reach out to someone who just had surgery, etc. The truth is, the kind of love we usually walk in is a selfish love. It is easy to get disappointed when our expectations are not met. We would like to be treated certain ways by certain people. We have great expectations. And let's just face it, some people will not treat you right. But all we can deal with is us. We cannot change them. Realize, at some time in your life, everybody in your life is going to let you down. Just plan on it. The only person who will never let you down is Jesus. We sang about it today. The fact is, it's, yeah, the more we expect or want from someone, the greater the potential for offense. We set ourselves up for offense when we require certain behaviors from certain people. The more we expect, the greater the potential for offense. And we expect certain things from our spouse, our friends, our coworkers, our children, our parents. And when they don't meet our expectations, we can get hurt and offended. They, however, usually don't even know we have these expectations of them in the first place. So, simplistically speaking, if I have no expectations about certain people, those people can't let me down. So, what can I do? Try to lower my expectations of other people. What I'm saying is, if I have no expectations about someone, then anything they give me is a blessing, and it's not something they owe me. 
we have to make choices to let go of some of these expectations of other people. See, if your expectations are down here more than up here, anything given is a gift. It's a blessing. All right. How do we overcome offense? What's the cure for offense? First, recognize you've taken the bait and you're in the trap. You know, are there certain people you kind of feel the heebie-jeebies around and you're tempted to tell your side of the story to other people and you're constantly rehearsing the past hurts? Ask God if you're hurt. And he's a loving father. He'll show you. And then ask him to give you the grace to get out of the offense. You know, it's kind of like an AA meeting. Hi, my name is Thora, and I'm offended. <laughs> but I'm serious. The first step is recognizing you are hurt. And, but often, pride keeps us from admitting we're hurt or we had our feelings hurt. I'm thinking, how many grown men do you know that would say to somebody, you know, I got my feelings hurt? No, no. It may be easier to just say, I was offended. One time in church, uh, during the situation I mentioned where my child was getting bullied, I was getting ready to take communion. And I got ready, and I was kind of praying something like, God, help me to forgive those jerky kids who are, are just like such bullies, and they're probably going to grow up to be jerks, kind of like their stupid parents are out their heads stuck in the sand. And, and then it dawned on me. It's like, I'm not ready to take communion right now, okay, it's, and if I don't feel ready to take him, I didn't take communion that day because I, had, I knew I had more processing to do. First part of the cure for offense is to recognize you're in the trap. Second thing, release the offense to God. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 14, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. When an offense has occurred, a debt is owed. You've heard it said, he owes me. He'll pay for this. You know, spouses may not say that, but they know how to give, give each other the cold shoulder or the silent treatment for a while. Forgiveness is like the cancellation of a debt. You tear up the debt owed, so to speak. And it is a process. It is an act of our will. The fact is forgiveness is a choice. It is not an emotion. We have to choose not to nurse, not to rehearse the offense. And some offenses will be much more challenging than others. Choose to take thoughts captive. If it helps you to process it, write it down, give it to Jesus in prayer, tear it up and throw it away. And you may have to do that again and again and again, depending on what it was. Because anytime it's picked up, it needs to be released again. Remember, don't take the bait. Say it with me. Don't take the bait. Okay, the first part of the cure for offense is to recognize you're in the trap. Then we release the offense to Jesus, and next we must release the offender. C.S. Lewis said, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. Okay. Forgiveness is a choice. It does not mean what the other person did was okay. It means we are choosing to forgive them. We must make the choice. You choose to forgive them, and then God is the only one who can change your heart. But you have to start somewhere. It starts with a choice. You will not start with warm, fuzzy feelings unless you're a different person than I am. You know, we've taught our kids to say, I'm sorry, will you please forgive me when they've sinned against their sibling or somebody else. And often, the child that says, I'm sorry, will you please forgive me, has an easier time saying that than the child that needs to say, I forgive you. Now, let's go back and think about Joseph for a minute. What would an offended man do when his brothers came to him asking for food? I think he might have said, I've waited years for this. First, we're going to put him in a pit. I have some things planned. No. History would have been changed if Joseph had acted like that. Joseph did not take revenge on his brothers because God was Joseph's protector. Now, does that mean Joseph didn't go through terrible times? No, he went through horrible times, dark times, sold as a slave, put in prison, betrayed, horrible times. But Joseph chose not to take the bait of offense. And years later, when his brothers came to Egypt seeking food in a great famine, and Joseph had been promoted to a high office, he was able to save his entire family. And he even said to them, it was not you who sent me here, but God sent me here to preserve life. He saw the bigger picture. 
if Joseph had held on to a fence, he would not have been able to do that. It would have affected his story, the story of his brothers, their kids, their kids, and so on. The truth is God has forgiven us a debt that is unpayable, and that is more than we're ever going to have to forgive anybody else. We have to learn how to let God be our protector and not us. You know, some of us today, our history and the history of our families will also be changed by how we deal with offense. What we do affects the fabric and future of our families. It ripples to subsequent generations. You can make life better for your children and in turn their children. After you've released the offender, then you need to receive the healing grace of God. No mortal man can supersede the plan of God in our lives. God is in control. Only we can supersede God's plans for us. And picking up a fence is one way that can happen. If Joseph had become a bitter man, he wouldn't have risen to the place of power he was in. But he sought God as his refuge, and we must do the same thing. God does not want you to hurt he wants you to have grace to be the person he created you to be and to do the things he created you to do, not a hurt and offended person. And there seems to be a direct relationship between picking up bitterness and offenses and missing God's grace in our lives. After we've released offenses, then we can begin to receive God's healing and function in the gifts and callings he has for us. Make the choice Say it with me one more time. Don't take the bait. Your history will be changed by how you handle offense. Now, I want us to have just a little bit of prayer time together. I've been asking the Holy Spirit what he wants to do. And while we're praying, if you feel led to be in a receiving mode with the Lord, you could lift your palms up when we're praying. I feel like God wanted specifically to pray for two groups of people the first are people who you've been hurt. You know, someone really has hurt you, and you need to receive the healing grace of God and ask God to heal the wounds that you've had from that situation. And the second set of people are people who, who probably also have been hurt, but you recognize that in some situation or relationship in your life, you've picked up the bait, and you're kind of trapped because of this person and you need to release the offense or the offender, and you need to release it to Jesus. So let's, let's just pray together right now. Holy Spirit, we ask for your presence. We ask you to come and minister to each person here. And I know there are people here who have deep wounds from things other people have done and said. And so we ask for the healing grace of God. I ask for freedom, that God would heal the wounds that you've had, that it wouldn't be something you'd come back to and come back to, that he would give you grace to forgive, grace to release it. He would give you freedom, that you would be able to release the person that sinned against you. And God, I pray that you would minister to the old wounds and the thoughts and the things that come up. Bring your healing balm, Father. Let the Holy Spirit minister to you. He's going to say different things to different people. Some of you may feel his presence on you, that he wants to bring healing to you. And God, for the other group of people who've recognized maybe they've picked up the bait, I also pray for freedom. And I pray that a decision would be made that you were going to release that, you were going to release the offense, you were going to release the offender, and you're going to make the choice that when it comes up again, you're going to release it again and again and again. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would break the tapes that have played, that have gone over and over scenarios, sometimes so many times, Father. Give grace and give freedom for people to release those things. God, we pray for freedom from you, freedom to be the people you've created us to be and to do the things you've created us to do and to not be bound anymore by the things the enemy has tried for some of us continually to put into our way. And so release to Jesus whatever needs to be released to him.
and some of you, the Holy Spirit's quickening things to your heart, to your spirit. Maybe your heart's kind of beating or your eyes are fluttering. I'm going to ask everybody to stand now. You know, and one of the best things you can do if the Holy Spirit's ministering to you like that is to come and let somebody pray for you. So as we get ready to release, I'm going to ask our ministry team to come forward. And if God's ministering to you, if something's going on, let somebody pray for you. Come forward and let a ministry team member pray for you. I also feel like there's uh, somebody here today dealing with just this whole thing of Christianity, that this seems like a foolish thing, but God's calling you and he's wooing you. And our, the late leader of our movement used to say, I'm a fool for Christ. Whose fool are you? There's nothing better than to be a fool for Christ and give everything over to him. So if you're somebody that's dealing with that today and you know you want more of Christ, you want more of Christianity, please come forward. So right now, if you're dealing with either one of those things, please come forward and our ministry team would love to pray for you. Let's just pray together and release the service. Father, I ask that you would bless each one here today, that you would give us grace, grace for who you've created us to be, Father. And we pray that you would help us to be an unoffendable people who would make the choice this week that we're not going to take the bait. Father, thank you for meeting with us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. If you need prayer, please come forward. We want to pray for you.